I am 60 years of age. That statistic means different things for different people. For me, since I am not in the best of health and feel I've lived enough for three lifetimes, it means that it is time I should start getting my affairs in order, as they say. It seems proper for me these days to be about the business of tying up the loose ends of my life, insofar as it is in my power to do so. I write this book in that endeavor. I wrote The Road Less Traveled at the vigorous age of 40. It was as if a spigot had been opened, and other books have come pouring out ever since. People have asked me what I hope to achieve by a particular book, as if I generally had a grand strategy in mind. The truth is, I wrote them not out of strategy, but simply because each book has said, Write me. However hard it might be to define, there is such a thing as a muse, and I have always and only operated under its orders. All of my books are quite different from one another, yet all of them have explored questions of epistemology. Epistemology is that branch of philosophy which addresses the question, how do we know what we think we know? How do we know anything? A major theme of my work is the encouragement of the greatest possible range of thought in our search for answers. And, as I have come to realize, all my works, whether for adults or children, whether focused upon the individual or society, whether fiction or non-fiction, may be looked upon in part as elaborations of one or more of the key concepts in The Road Less Traveled. As elaborations, they carry those concepts further. They look deeper. They go beyond. This book is entitled The Road Less Traveled and Beyond because it ties together many of the ways over the past 20 years that I was pushed, often stumbling, to move beyond my first book in both my public writing and my personal journey. Some may consider The Road Less Traveled and Beyond a compilation, a compendium, or a summary of all my published work but those words are inadequate. Synthesis would be a more adequate description, but still fails to capture the beyondness of this work. For in addition to tying up loose ends, I wanted to break new ground as well. I have been powerfully assisted in doing so by a quote attributed to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who once said, I don't give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity. But I would die for the simplicity on the other side. His profound sentiment has led me to organize this work into three sections. Part one is called Crusade Against Simplism. In it, I decry the primitive and effortless simplistic thinking that lies at the root of so much individual and societal sickness. In Part 2, Wrestling with Reality, I describe the complex choices we must continually make and remake if we are to live well. And in Part 3, The Other Side of Complexity, I describe where we can arrive when we have been willing to pay all our proper intellectual and emotional dues. Although the phrase, the other side, rings with possible intimations of heaven, I am not so bold as to suggest that we can reach a heaven on earth, this side of the grave. What I do suggest, however, is that we can indeed come to exist in a closer relationship to the holy, and that on the other side of complexity there is a kind of simplicity where we can know with humility that in the end all things point to God.
Part One: Crusade Against Simplism. In Ireland, the Middle East, Somalia, Sri Lanka, and countless other war-torn areas around the world, prejudice, religious intolerance, greed, and fear have erupted into violence that has taken the lives of millions. In America. The damage caused by institutionalized racism is perhaps more subtle, but no less devastating to the social fabric. Rich versus poor, black versus white, pro-life versus pro-choice, straight versus gay, all are social, political, and economic conflicts fought under the banner of some ideology or deeply held belief. But given the divisive and destructive results. Are these ideologies and beliefs rational, or mere rationalizations for otherwise unreasonable acts? How often, in fact, do we stop to think about what we believe? One of the major dilemmas we face, both as individuals and as a society, is simplistic thinking, or the failure to think at all. It isn't just a problem; it is the problem. If we don't begin to think well, it's highly likely that we may end up killing ourselves. Although I believe the route to finding answers is primarily through better thinking, even this is not as simple as it may seem. Thinking is difficult, thinking is complex, and thinking is more than anything else a process with a course or direction, a lapse of time. And a series of steps or stages that lead to some result. To think well is a laborious, often painstaking process until one becomes accustomed to being thoughtful. An all too common flaw is that most people tend to believe they somehow instinctively know how to think and communicate. In reality, they do neither well. Either because they are too self-satisfied to examine their assumptions about thinking, or too self-absorbed to invest the time and energy to do so. As a result, it is impossible to tell why they think as they do, or how they make their decisions. And when challenged, they show very little awareness, or become easily frustrated about the dynamics involved in truly thinking and communicating well. From my practice as a psychiatrist and my experiences and observations in general, I have become familiar with the common errors related to the failure to think well. One, of course, is simply not thinking. Another is making assumptions in thinking through the use of one-dimensional logic, stereotypes, and labeling. Another problem is the belief that thinking and communication don't require much effort. Another is assuming that thinking is a waste of time, which is a particular factor in the quiet rage we experience around the failure to solve many social problems. Everywhere we turn, the evidence is astounding. Simplistic thinking has become pandemic in society. Unfortunately. Various institutions, in their failure to teach or demonstrate how to think well, set people up for thinking simplistically. Typically, this failure is found among the most influential institutions of society, including more often than not the family, the church, and the mass media. These institutions often unwittingly promote half truths, sometimes even blatant lies. Under the guise of cultural ideas that we've taken for granted to be normal, on the basis of cultural norms, we usually assume that if everyone is thinking this or doing that, it must be normal and correct. There are positive norms, of course, such as those that promote the work ethic and encourage civility in our interactions with each other. But the negative norms are the ones that create cultural chaos, and they are the ones we must rethink. Frequently, they are dressed up and made to look and sound pretty, but when you go beneath the surface, 
you'll find they are negative precisely because they discourage our growth. They are based on half-truths and outright lies that serve to manipulate and hold us hostage psychologically and spiritually. The biggest lie promoted by some of our social institutions is that we're here to be happy all the time. For motives of profit, the lies of materialism and advertising suggest that if we're not happy, comfortable, and fulfilled, we must be eating the wrong cereal or driving the wrong car or that we must not have it right with God. How wicked! The truth is that our finest moments, more often than not, occur precisely when we are uncomfortable, when we're not feeling happy or fulfilled, when we're struggling and searching. In this bombardment of one-dimensional thinking, we're told in clear but subtle ways about what is expected of us in order to fit into society. If we want to be seen as normal, we are simply expected to go along with the lies. Our laziness, our natural idolatry of ease and comfort, makes us co-conspirators with the mass media. Media images are ripe with rigid concepts about our humanity. The negative norm in our advertising directly or indirectly suggests that women are primarily sexual objects who lose their value as they age. The valuable male in our advertising is the one who makes money in part because of the simplism inherent in sexist thinking, many a man deems his work outside the home as exponentially more important than his wife's homemaking skills in order to boost his self-image, despite the tensions it creates to uphold his flawed assumptions. Rather than update their vision, both men and women in our society engage in simplistic thinking, in order to conform to negative norms. We have an obligation to confront our simplistic thinking about what being normal should mean. To use critical thinking doesn't mean that everyone must become a walking encyclopedia, but we have an obligation to study, learn, and think about those things that are of high importance. One of the most crucial skills of critical thinking is that of deciding what is essential to think or learn about and what is non-essential. And we must acknowledge the gaps in our own knowledge rather than let pride, fear, or laziness lure us into taking the role of the know-it-all. To assume we know everything, and particularly something we don't really know, as the old saying goes, is to make an ass out of you and me. There are people who assume their way of thinking, whether it's about a woman's right to abortion or about prayer in schools, has to be always right, despite any evidence to the contrary. They can't, won't, consider alternatives. Some of the most common and often destructive assumptions are based on stereotypes about ourselves and other people. Stereotyping typically involves labeling and categorizing people and things in a simple-minded manner. Many make judgments about others on the basis of labels, such as associating liberals with bleeding hearts and conservatives with the righteously rigid. Racial and ethnic labels are rife with misleading assumptions about the characters of individuals who are identified with these groups. There is a common assumption among many that anyone who openly calls himself a Christian must be a fundamentalist, or that anyone who calls himself agnostic must not be spiritually mature. We need to use labels to size up some things. There are times when we must make temporary decisions until we have more information or experience about a situation or person. But for the most part, we tend to label for the wrong reasons. When we use labeling to make assumptions and unjustly discriminate against others, 
or to make excuses for ourselves. We infer broader qualities about a person or a situation without the information necessary to support our conclusions. Sometimes the consequences can be destructive not only to others but to ourselves. When I was in psychiatry training, schizophrenia was labeled as a thinking disorder or a thought disorder. Since that time, I have come to believe that all psychiatric disorders are thinking disorders. Individuals at the extremes of mental illness, such as those with some forms of schizophrenia, are clearly the victims of disordered thinking and may be so far out of touch with reality that they cannot function well in day-to-day -day activities. Yet we have all met narcissists, obsessive compulsives, and passive dependent people in our social and work lives. Their mental health may be fragile, but they manage to appear normal and get by. The fact, however, is that they too are disordered thinkers. Narcissists cannot think about other people. Obsessive compulsives cannot think about the big picture. Passive dependent people cannot think for themselves. In every psychiatric condition I have worked with over the years, there was some disorder of thinking involved. Most people who go into therapy are suffering from either a neurosis or a character disorder. Among the general population who never go to see a psychotherapist, these conditions are equally prominent and are, again, the result of disordered thinking. Both are, at root, illusions of responsibility, and as such they are opposite styles of thinking and relating to the world and the problems in life. The neurotic person is under the illusion that she is responsible for everyone or everything, and, as a result, often assumes too much responsibility. When neurotics are in conflict with the world, they tend to automatically assume that they are at fault. The person with the character disorder, on the other hand, operates under the illusion that he shouldn't have to be responsible for himself or anyone else. Thus, he's not likely to take on enough responsibility. Let me point out that all of us have to live with some illusions. They are what psychologists call healthy illusions that help support us during periods of transition in life and give us hope. Take the illusion of romantic love. People wouldn't get married without it. The illusion that raising children is going to be more fun than pain is healthy too. Otherwise, we wouldn't have children. Illusions are not totally bad unless we hold on to them far too long and beyond their usefulness. The problem comes when our illusions consistently interfere with growth. For example, the 16-year-old who becomes obsessive in her thinking about her eating habits and appearance may react as if she is never thin enough or good enough to measure up to the other girls in her school. In taking this illusion to an extreme, she may starve herself and become anorectic. Or she may outgrow this neurotic dilemma by the time she reaches her twenties and become more confident and self-assured. So a mild neurosis or slight character disorder need not be viewed as a lifetime disposition. On the other hand, our persistent neuroses and character disorders are crippling if not dealt with. Carl Jung wrote, Neurosis is always a substitute for legitimate suffering. But the substitute can become more painful than the legitimate suffering it was designed to avoid. As I wrote in The Road Less Traveled, true to form, many will then attempt to avoid this pain and this problem, in turn building layer upon layer of neurosis. Fortunately, however, some possess the courage to face their neuroses and begin, usually with the help of psychotherapy, to learn how to experience legitimate suffering.
In any case, when we avoid the legitimate suffering that results from dealing with problems, we also avoid the growth that problems demand from us. When I was in training, it was fashionable to decry intellectual insight. The only thing that was considered important was emotional insight, as if intellectual understanding was worthless. This was simplistic thinking. While I agree that ultimately there has to be emotional insight, most of the time you can't even begin to understand the emotional aspects of an individual case until you have attained intellectual insight. Let us take the Oedipus complex, for example. An adult with an unresolved Oedipus complex cannot be healed unless he first intellectually knows what an Oedipus complex is, if he can be healed at all. To become healthy adults, we first must resolve the Oedipal dilemma of giving up our sexual feelings for our parents. If it's a boy, the father is seen as the competition for the mother's attention. If it's a girl... The desire for the father as a sexual or love object means competing with the mother. It's crucial that as people become adults, they come to terms with not being able to possess the parent in the way that they have fantasized. A woman who moved from Florida to Connecticut to see me for therapy was a case in point. She was an early fan of The Road Less Traveled, and she had the money to make such a move. In hindsight, I should have discouraged her from packing up and moving so far because there are always local therapists available. It was one of several mistakes I made in this case, and her healing was incomplete. Given the difficulties I encountered with her in therapy, the furthest we got in penetrating the real issue was the day when she first heard herself clearly utter her hidden motives for coming to me for therapy. After leaving a session this particular day, she sat in her car, sobbing and shaking at the steering wheel. Well, maybe when I get over my Oedipus complex, she said, then Dr. Peck will marry me. I had become the father figure in her life, a replacement for the father she could not have. Later, she said to me, maybe you're right. Maybe I do have an Oedipus complex. But we wouldn't have gotten even that far had I not first intellectually explained to her what an Oedipus complex was. To give up something represents making a change, but many people are unwilling to make the changes that will heal them. That is the sort of price they pay for a thinking disorder. Given our almost addictive reliance on assumptions and the illusions that coexist with them, we often miscommunicate with others, creating great chaos. The failure to question our assumptions leads to failures in really hearing what is being communicated to us. We remain oblivious to the basics of good communication. Many people think that listening is a passive interaction. It is just the reverse. Listening well is an active exercise of our attention and, by necessity, hard work. When we extend ourselves by attempting to listen and communicate well, we take an extra step or walk an extra mile. We do so in opposition to the inertia of laziness or the resistance of fear, which always requires hard work. Listening well requires total concentration upon another and is a manifestation of love in the broadest sense of the word. An essential part of listening well is the discipline of bracketing, the temporary giving up or setting aside of your own prejudices, frames of reference, and desires in order to experience as far as possible another's world from the inside, stepping inside his or her shoes. This unification of speaker and listener is actually an extension an enlargement of ourselves, and new knowledge is always gained from it. Moreover, since listening well involves bracketing, 
It also temporarily involves a total acceptance of the other. Sensing this acceptance, the speaker will feel less and less vulnerable and more and more inclined to open up the inner recesses of his or her mind to the listener. As this happens, speaker and listener begin to understand each other more and more. Most of the time we lack this energy. Even though we may feel in our business dealings or social relationships that we are listening well, what we are usually doing is listening selectively. Often we have a preset agenda in mind and wonder as we listen how we can achieve certain desired results to get the conversation over with as quickly as possible or redirected in ways more satisfactory to us. Many of us are far more interested in talking than in listening, or we simply refuse to listen to what we don't want to hear. I have found that knowing that one is being truly listened to is frequently, in and of itself, remarkably therapeutic. It should go without saying that you can't truly communicate well if you don't listen well, and you are unable to listen well unless you are thinking well. There is a sharp distinction between disordered versus clear thinking. Yet there is a rule in psychiatry that there is no such thing as a bad thought or feeling. It is a useful rule in certain ways. In other ways, it is itself simplistic. We can make ethical judgments only about actions. If someone thinks about hitting you and then proceeds to bash you over the head with a lamp, that is bad. To just think about doing it isn't. It is the distinction between private thought and public action. The latter involves externalizing our thoughts by acting on them. So we arrive at a paradox regarding freedom and thinking. On the one hand, we are free to think anything. To be healed, we have to be free to be ourselves. But that doesn't mean we are free to impose our thoughts on others or engage in destructive actions without consequences. Thus, with the freedom to think and feel comes the responsibility to discipline our thoughts and feelings. I champion a proposal by a friend of mine who wants to underscore these points in a symbolic way. He believes we should erect a statue of responsibility on the West Coast to bring balance to the Statue of Liberty that stands on the East Coast. Indeed, we cannot separate freedom from responsibility. With the freedom that we have to think for ourselves, ultimately we must hold ourselves accountable for how and what we think and whether we are using our capacity for thinking to get the most out of life.